I'll start with introductions and then we'll go from there. All right. Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Death in Cambodia, Life in America. Season two is upon us, and I am kicking it off with a very, very, very special guest. Today here, we have a man named John Burgess. He was a stringer for the Time Magazine and the Washington Post from 1979 to the 1980s, covering on the ground exactly what had happened in these Cambodian refugee camps. He had his firsthand experience on the grounds of the camps, witnessing everything going on from the starving people marching out of the forest to being there the day of First Lady Carter and when she visited in November of 1979. So when he reached out, I could not pass up the opportunity (laughs) to pick his brain and give all the listeners an inside scoop of exactly what his experience was like. So thank you, John, and welcome to the podcast. Thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here. (laughs) Well, um, I'm I'm so excited. We have a whole bunch of questions that we want to dive into. So before we kind of get into the nitty gritty, um, why don't we start off with how did you become a freelance writer for the crisis during this time in 1979? Mm -hmm. Well, I had lived in Thailand as a high school student in the 1960s and then went back there in the 70s and got a start in journalism. So uh, when this crisis broke out, uh, uh, I was living in Hong Kong with my uh, with my wife and got an offer. Would I go back to Thailand and cover this this amazing news story for The Washington Post and for Time magazine? So I was sort of the the low cost solution to uh, 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 to this problem in that uh, normally a, a course a full staff correspondent would go which would be cost a lot more money but anyway I uh, this uh, this opportunity came and we moved from Hong Kong to Thailand to do to to cover this amazing event and my wife actually ended up working for the UN refugee program oh wow wow yeah So, and for everybody who doesn't know what a stringer is, I know I mentioned that terminology, um, it is a freelance writer. Somebody, can you kind of explain for everybody what a stringer really is? Sure. It means, it means a part-time correspondent and the word stringer comes from the, uh, the old days when what you were paid, uh, uh, was measured by how long a string was, how many column inches measuring the stories that you uh, that you uh, that you produce. So you were literally paid by the inch as measured by a string. Oh, wow. But it normally means you have some kind of arrangement with that news organization that they can call on you when they need you. Okay. Okay. So. In total, uh, so you moved out to Thailand and you were Uh living in, I believe, Bangkok at the time. That's right. Okay. Um, How many days in total (coughs) would you say you were covering this this story for? Sure. I would say, uh, you know, I was there over the course of more than a year, about 15 months. But I would say I spent probably 30 or 40 days on the ground uh, in these places. Okay. And then when you got there, uh, did you kind of have an idea of what was going on when they, when they called you on this project? And when you got there, was it what you expected? Uh, the answer is absolutely not. No one had any idea of, of what they were about to witness as, as journalists. Uh, we arrived in Bangkok uh, in August or September of 79, and I started going up to the border to see what I could see. There were sort of rumors in Bangkok of huge numbers of Cambodians moving toward the uh, border and crossing into Thailand. Uh, the Thai army had sort of sealed off large parts of the border, so you, didn't, you weren't able just to come and go as you wanted. You had to, you had to get permission. But uh, in no way was I prepared for, for what was coming in the next year. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I would imagine that's the same sentiment for many of the people who covered it. Um, uh, I think so. Yeah. Yep. 
so what were what were some of your challenges? Um, you mentioned a little bit about just now about um, you know not having permission everywhere. What what areas did you cover exactly? First of all, and what were some of the challenges in covering that? Sure. Well, most of the reporting I did was near the Thai border town of Aranya Patet. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and refugees came across nor uh, the border north of uh, Aranya Patet and south of Aranya Patet. So one, we had, uh, we had the challenge of getting access, being actually to go in and see with our own eyes and talk to people on our own. Uh, and it, it, it literally changed day by day. Sometimes the Thai army was very restrictive and sometimes you were free to come and go. Uh, another issue was language. Uh, I had studied Thai for a long time, so I was always looking for Cambodians who spoke Thai and there are a few of them, uh, but for the most part, it was difficult to communi communicate with people. And the other one was was personal security. You know, you never you never knew exactly where you were going and what you were going to run into when you went around a corner on on a trail crossing crossing rice fields. Uh, so uh, uh, I would typically go up there two or three days at a time, and you know, spend the nights in in Aranya Patet, and then go back out and see what I could see. Then go back to Bangkok and file, and this was, you know, before the days of, of cell phones, when you could, when you could file without any trouble from essentially any place on the globe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would imagine when you're going there, um, and, and and other people that I've spoke to who have been there firsthand had mentioned this kind of interesting dynamic between it, whether it be political or emotional between the ties versus the organizations and the refugees or what did you what did you <coughs> notice was kind of the the dynamics between all everybody at that time sure uh well the ties were already hosting tens of thousands of refugees from laos uh, mm -hmm. And uh, they were in long in long term camps, mostly in the northeast of Thailand. And basically, the Thai government's position is: we do not want another huge refugee population crossing into our territory and staying forever. And so, at, in the beginning, uh, the Thai position was: we'll let people come in for a little while, but they've got to go back. We this is uh, this is not an open border, right? Right. And uh, they uh, obviously that's a different position than the UN refugee program and international NGOs would take. That they would want to go, <laughs> they would want to go in and deliver food and medical care and and make life easier for these people who were in you know very serious trauma. Over time, the ties relented and allowed large numbers of uh, Cambodians to come in and to uh, to live at a newly created camp called Kawidang mm -hmm. and there to undergo you know immigration interviews and placement for travel onward to to third countries uh, but it was only with the uh, express promise of foreign governments that people would be settled that they would be they would be supported uh, materially; that they wouldn't, you know, <laughs> cost the Thai, uh, cost Thailand money. And actually, toward the end, uh, uh, conditions were sufficiently good in the in Kawidang camp in terms of nutrition and uh, and uh, medical care that the Thai government actually required uh, NGOs who wanted to work there to also provide services to ordinary Thai villages in that, in that part of the country. And so typically a, an NGO had to make that pledge to divide their work between Cambodians and, and Thais. So by the time you got there, you would say the camps had already started getting a lot of help or were you, I think you were there from, what was the month you were there, John? 
from the uh, well, I, I arrived in September, and the, the big influx of people began in October. Okay. And so uh, when I got there, there was basically nothing on mm -hmm. the border camps. Uh, people were crossing and literally setting up camp, you know, on, uh, in the middle of a forest, in the middle of a rice field, mm -hmm. and just camping out there and hoping that they could go in further, maybe be resettled in a third country, or at least, you know, escape the, the danger and, and the disease and the food shortages that were ravaging Cambodia in the interior. So uh, in, in a number of cases, you know, I, I witnessed, you know, thou groups of thousands of people crossing into Thailand and just setting up, setting up camp and hoping for whatever, whatever came next. And then as there was international media coverage of this, uh, there began to be a mobilization around the world, actually quite fast, that there's a huge humanitarian crisis going on and NGOs from all over the world came in and uh, <clears throat> were, were seeking permission to go and provide these essential services. Yeah, I, I'm really, really fascinated that you were actually able to witness from as a third party person, the march of people coming out and flooding yeah. out of these, these, these forests. Can you kind of walk us through, was it a particular day or was it something you just noticed over time? Can you walk us through what you saw? Well, I can, I can recall very well the, the first time that I saw it, uh, which was, I would say, in early October of 1979. Mm -hmm. uh, I had gone with a Time magazine correspondent up to the border and we were sitting in a Thai military camp trying to get permission to go in, talking to an officer and one of his aides came in and said, oh, 10 Cambodians have crossed the border at such and such village. And we thought, oh, that's very interesting. And five minutes later, uh, he came in and said, no, it's, it's 100 Cambodians. And then literally five minutes after that, he said, 1,000. So we said, we want to go and see this. And we got in our car and drove 10 or 15 miles, whatever it was. And suddenly we were just totally shocked to come across this scene of a mammoth parade of, of Cambodians walking along the highway, carrying, uh, carrying bags of rice, carrying cooking pots, carrying children, many of them in terrible, terrible physical condition. You could, you could look at them and, and tell that they were almost ready to fall down. There were, there were people on crutches, and they were sort of being shepherded along this road by Thai soldiers and led to a field down the road where basically they just, they just collapsed on, <laughs> onto the dirt and, uh, and wondered what was going to come next. And, you know, as it went along, we discovered the circumstances here. And these, this was a group of people who had come out from a Khmer Rouge-controlled pocket right up against the Thai border. And they had been under pressure from the army of Vietnam, which had invaded uh, Cambodia, what, uh, eight months, nine months earlier. Right. And with that, there was, uh, this was basically a group of Khmer Rouge soldiers and with them, a bunch of large numbers of civilians whom they had essentially enslaved and brought along with them when they retreated from the Vietnamese. And these people were still under the control of the Khmer Rouge. And you, you could see it before your eyes, Khmer Rouge cadre walking around this camp and giving orders here, giving orders there. Uh, and many of these people approached journalists and said, please, can you help me get out of here? I want to go to uh, a place that's not controlled by by the Khmer Rouge. So it, it, was, it was a heartbreaking scene in that there were a lot of young men with them, uh, and these men, young men, were clearly soldiers, and they were in good health. They were well fed. They didn't seem sick, and that was evidence that this was the priority that was going on in these Khmer Rouge zones. That we feed the fighters who can, who can fight against the Vietnamese, and everybody else we don't have to worry about. Uh, so that meant starvation, disease. You. 
you name it. Uh, and these, these people were in terrible, terrible condition. So th- that, that was actually my very first <laughs> experience with, with what this story was going to, going to mean. <laughs> And how did it feel once you witnessed that? Um, did you feel a greater sense of responsibility for covering what you needed to cover? Well, I, I, I'd say I, I had two reactions. And one was, as a journalist, what an amazing story. I have to get in there and find out what's going on mm-hmm. <laughs> and write something and let the world uh, know, know what's going on here. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, indeed, our media coverage was helped to drive uh, uh, humanitarian aid to this place as it happens all over the world that the media will start reporting that there's a real problem somewhere and NGOs and UN agencies follow that but at the same time you couldn't you couldn't witness this kind of thing without feeling some kind of kind of uh, personal personal involvement and personal empathy uh, and people would approach you and they assumed that you as, you know, a, a, uh, you know, a white foreigner, right. uh, you must be some kind of a doctor. You must know things. You must have food. You must be able to help them. And of course, you know, I didn't know the first thing about treating, <laughs> treating diseases like this and, after a while, what I did was uh, I, I bought giant jars of vitamin pills in Aranya Patet. And you, you could go into a pharmacy there and buy a, a big, big jar of vitamin pills with like, you know, a thousand pills wow. or something. And, and this was the only thing that, that I could give to people. And so I would sometimes when I walked around these places, that was the thing I could give them. I knew it was you can't really hurt yourself taking two, very, two vitamins, but I would try to leave instructions, make them understand one of these today, only one. You won't get better by taking 10. Uh, but that was sort of my, my way of sort of stepping outside of my journalistic role. And then after a few months, people, a few weeks even, people who really knew what they were doing, doctors and nurses and emergency medical teams were, were on the scene and I, I didn't need to do that anymore. <laughs> that's, that's incredible. I think um, just, wow. I, I, I think it's amazing that you were able to, to, to witness that and really see that. Um, and you mentioned, you know, people looking at you as a white foreigner as you must know something <laughs> did that happen everywhere you went you every every time you you walked around was it common for people to ask you like i need help i need help well uh yes it did it did happen right it did happen quite a bit you know in one sense these people had been inside cambodia for the last four years and somehow surviving under Khmer Rouge rule at a time when there were no <laughs> white foreigners in Cambodia. Right. And, and seeing someone like me, in some cases, would set off the light bulb in peoples where they're saying, wow, maybe things are going to go back to normal. Right. Uh, maybe, we're, maybe life will return somewhat to what it, what it used to be. Uh, that was one reaction, and another reaction was just to look right past you, and to, and there was sometimes when I felt I was a ghost wandering around, right. uh, uh, because nobody paid any attention to me, and I I could raise a camera and take pictures, and no one would bat an eyelash right. <laughs> about it. So there was these 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 two very different reactions. Right. Right. I'm also very curious, um, too, you mentioned about having to get permission, (coughs) getting permission. Um, If you need water, you can get some. No worries. No, I'm Um, fine. um, If you get having to get permission from the ties to Mm -hmm. cover media, what what did that permission mean? Did you have restrictions on what you can do? take pictures of or couldn't take or you what did that mean uh generally uh it just meant that you could they gave you a piece of paper and you had to go through Thai military roadblocks to get to the border so you whipped out this piece of paper and showed it to the soldiers and they would let you through 
but but once you were there you were free to wander around and talk to anyone you wanted and essentially do anything you wanted so uh that it was really just sort of a geographical a place restriction Mm -hmm. okay and were there any other um writers around you john or were you, did you were you kind of the only one there or from what you knew of uh no there were there were other people people like me stringers mm-hmm. from bangkok and uh, you know i would often travel with an, you know another foreign journalist you know we would split expenses and mm-hmm. you know rent rent a car jointly and i think also you felt a little bit better being there with a second person you know in right. case there was in case there was some some kind of trouble uh so it blew hot and cold uh you know sometimes full correspondence and tv crews would would come in and i i would uh well when a full correspondent from time or the washington post came my role then became you know gopher facilitator interpreter and i i generally wasn't writing my own stories they were writing the stories mm-hmm. But uh, but yeah, there were. I I was, I I was not the only person uh, in this place. So, um, can you recall an instance, John, where you felt like you were risking your life to kind of capture a story that you saw or followed? Yeah. Well, uh, you know, generally speaking, I did not feel in danger going into these places. Uh, uh, generally speaking, there wasn't fighting going on most of the time, and you could you could drive around. But there, there was one incident that I, I do remember, in which uh, a fellow journalist, a guy named John Macbeth, who worked for the Far Eastern Economic Review, we were driving up and down the border in this area where the Khmer Rouge groups had come across, and the system was in, the situation was in such flux. Uh, people moving around, a uh, camp is here on one day and then the next day it's gone. We were just sort of trying to scope out what was happening and we got out of the car and we walked down a trail towards Cambodia. And this is an area where the border is not clearly marked and you never really know, are you in Thailand? Are you in Cambodia? Uh, we walked uh, a while and uh, Suddenly, we rounded a corner, and, and, and there was an, an armed squad of Khmer Rouge soldiers taking a break along this trail. Maybe twenty people. They were all they were all sitting down and just and just resting. And we said, "Oh my God, we uh, <laughs> how did this happen? We didn't intend this." And then there was a terrific outbreak of gunfire from somewhere beyond us. It, it sounded very very close, but you know. It probably wasn't that far. It probably wasn't that close. I mean, and the commander of these of these soldiers turned out to be quite friendly, and he spoke some Thai. And we went up, and and we were basically doing a quick interview with him, and he was telling us about how his men had killed two Vietnamese the day before, and. Uh, uh, we did that for a few minutes and then we thought this is not the place to be we better get out of here <laughs> so we just turned around and walked back down uh, <laughs> down that trail came back to our car which was just sitting there waiting for us and uh, and and drove away uh there were a couple of other incidents uh uh once when there was there was sort of limit some limited fighting between the thai army and the vietnamese army and we were standing at the interstru- intersection of two roads and mortar rounds started landing around us, apparently fired by the Vietnamese. So we ran and took shelter under a bridge that was, that was right nearby. But generally, you get to have a sense in these situations of danger. Uh, and there were many times when we would either hear about trouble or we could sense danger. And so we would say, Far enough, we're not going down this this road. We're going to turn around and go back. But but that running into those Khmer Rouge soldiers was a uh, a uh, an experience I will never forget. And the during the 1970 to 75 war in Cambodia, if you as a foreign journalist 
ever came into the hands of Khmer Rouge soldiers, that was the end of you, basically. Right. You would never be heard from again. And the geopolitics of the situation flipped by 180 degrees overnight when the Vietnamese invaded Cambodia in 1978 to overthrow the Cam Khmer Rouge. And suddenly the Khmer Rouge were viewing people like me as allies. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they felt that the whole world was on their side against the, uh, against the Vietnamese. So that was, it was, it could be very creepy talking to these people who would, who would treat you like, like an ally, like a friend suddenly. And a few years either uh, earlier, uh, they would have murdered you. <laughs> right. Mm. I, I bet you must have been scared. You yeah, well, that, that, that situation. Uh, but, you know, there, there were plenty of other times when I talked to Khmer Rouge uh, in, in non-violent situations like that, in camps that they were running and where nothing was going on. And again, you always had this very creepy feeling that who knows what is the history of this person, the right. personal history of that person that I'm talking to. What, you know, what crimes might he have committed? And, and here he is, you know, you know, talking affably with you. <laughs> right, right. You mentioned interview with the Khmer Rouge soldier. It wasn't an actual interview where you were able to take down notes and whatever. What, what were some of the questions you had asked him? Well, I, I, I can't quite remember. I, I think we probably only talked with five minutes. I mean, we were crouching and we went up to him and said, what's going on? What's going on? And, right. and, he, uh, and he started talking about what was going on. I remember he, we, we, we heard weapons nearby and he was sort of identifying whose weapon that was. And he said, he, we, hear, we hear kaboom and he says, that's a 60 millimeter mortar, one of ours. Uh, <laughs> so I don't, I don't know if we took notes or when we got back to the car, we sort of just reconstructed what we could, we could remember, but it was certainly not your formal set piece interview. <laughs> I can imagine um, people being, some people being really sensitive because you were walking around with a camera, weren't you, John? Um, yeah, you know, and I, I wish I had take, I did not take any pictures of those guys, and I, I, I wish I had tried to, and I don't know whether it was because I couldn't, I, I forgot about the camera, or because you, you're right, in a military situation, soldiers are they don't like cameras. And when a camera comes up, they think, oh, this person is a spy. This person right. <laughs> is committing. We cannot allow ourselves to be photographed. So that that may have been going through my head. Or just the fact that you were in the presence of a Khmer Rouge soldier. I mean, yeah, I yeah. <laughs> that's that's more likely that I just didn't didn't think to do it. <laughs> I, I, my first my first reaction would probably be to get the heck out of here, not to take the camera out. <laughs> yeah. Um, but but in other instances as well, I mean, you did walk around with a camera. I mean, can you talk a little bit about whether or not you had some resistance in terms of content that you can take or not because of the dynamics? Yeah, uh, I would say generally in all the other situations, uh, I, I took a lot of pictures. I took hundreds of photographs uh, mm -hmm. in this period. And uh, in some cases, you know, you know, I, I, I was talking earlier about how the presence of a white foreigner meant maybe life is going back to normal. Often when you would raise a camera, people would smile, <laughs> you know, the, the, the normal reaction when a, when a, a camera comes up and, and uh, uh, you know, as a journalist, generally, you don't want people looking at the camera when you take a picture <laughs> right. because right. then the camera looks kind of, the photo looks kind of staged and you right. prefer if people are going about their business without looking at the lens of the camera. But often people would smile, would laugh, uh, would, would, would come around and, you know, and kids would, you know, strike funny poses and, and that kind of thing. But in other places, you know, I, I photographed some horrendous, <laughs> horrendous situations of, of starvation and disease. And in those, I felt I have, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm intruding on this person's privacy, but this photograph will truly send a powerful message to the outside world. And in those cases where people were so sick 
that they were hardly responding. It, uh, they barely noticed me. I, I don't know that they noticed me at all. Uh, yes, and for those and for those listeners, uh, John had so graciously sent me some of his photos that he had dug up in his attic. Um, and he had sent to me digitally, which I will be sharing with some of you guys by his permission. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> sure, that. sure. Um, next topic I want to dive into is the day of First Lady Carter's visit. So hmm. for all the listeners, John was actually there, actually was there on the day of her visit. Um, and I'd love to just get into the day of so can you walk can you walk us through that day I mean I don't think there's anybody I know who had been on there so close to her on the day of what was that day like sure uh she it was a very brief visit just a day or two she flew into Bangkok and then flew up to the border landed she was flown up by the Thai government and landed at a Thai military base near the border and I have to tell you, it was something of a circus because the, basically the White House press corps had come along with her. There were roughly 150 journalists tagging along for this visit by Rosalind Carter. Oh, wow. And so uh, it was a sort of, you know, media pool kind of situation. Uh, and so I, I guess we had our own separate airplane that, you know, flew following her airplane. And then we all, there were buses out to the camp. And she, you know, Rosalind Carter and her husband are, are people with good hearts. You know, they're politicians, but you can detect that there's something genuine about their empathy. And she was essentially visiting this place to sort of signal to the world. And I'm sure what was going on. And I, I'm sure people back in the White House had sort of calculated that, if Rosalind Carter went and saw with her own eyes what was going on, this would help even more, you know, to mobilize, mobilize the world. Uh, uh, so she arrived. She went into this squalid, squalid camp where the Khmer Rouge and prisoners had been moved a, a few weeks earlier. The, the people I, I was just talking about who were at the border, after a while, they were all bussed to this newly established camp, maybe 30 miles inside Thailand. And, and again, just left there on their own, by, though by now supplies and NGOs were, were coming in. It, it was a horrible place, the Sakao temp, uh, camp, it was called. And the Khmer Rouge were still in charge of these people. Uh, and it had a hospital where people were dying daily in large numbers of, you know, of dysentery, malaria, you know, all these easily, easily controlled diseases. So Rosalind Carter actually walked through that camp. And my memory is that I was, since all 150 people couldn't come, <laughs> there was a pool of people who were allowed to go inside uh, this hospital, which was basically a field hospital, you know, a, a giant tent with, with beds uh, set up. And Rosalind Carter walked and, you know, tried to interact with different people who were, who were in the beds. And at one point, she, she took up a spoon and sort of spoon fed uh, a patient in, in bed. I can't remember, was it a man or a woman or a child? Uh, but anyway, she really did get right very close to this. Uh, uh, so she was there, I would say, an hour, two hours, something like that. Then she got back in her plane and flew to a camp of Laotian refugees. I, I mentioned them earlier, and I'm sure the Thais probably insisted that she go to the place, the Laotian camp, to show the world that there's also this huge population of Laotian refugees in uh, in Thailand. And, and after that, she went and had an audience with the king and the queen. And so I don't know if she was on the ground more than 24 hours or what, but, but it, it, it was a, uh, uh, it, it, it was part of an effort to bring public, bring the world's attention to this incredible crisis that was going on. And she, she spoke to us journalists a little bit after and said she was overwhelmed. She had never seen anything like it, but 
whenever you're dealing with someone in the White House, there's a limit as to how how close you actually get and how much time you actually spend with them. Right. Do, do you think? Um, I mean, do you be, do you believe the Americans at home really understood the urgency of what was happening at the borders? Well, I mean, the typical American did not, but people who follow foreign affairs, there was a period for about two weeks when this was on the front page day after day. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the stories that I wrote for the Washington Post were on the front page. So uh, uh, people who paid attention to this kind of thing in Congress and the White House and this international aid community, uh, they were very much aware of it, but I, I would <laughs> doubt that it penetrated very far beyond that. You know, the Vietnam War had been open over for the previous five years, four years, and uh, and you know, American public opinion had had moved on. <laughs> mm-hmm. So I would assume then, Miss, you know, Miss um, Carter's visit to Cambodia really kind of reopened the eyes to everybody. What do you think? What do you think was her impact uh, of, of her visit to Cambodia? Yeah, well, I, I wasn't, uh, uh, you know, I wasn't back in Washington, but my, my memory is that her visit, which got a lot of media coverage and the sort of independent media stories, uh, uh, helped sort of mobilize aid dollars. Uh, and mm-hmm. and helped bring you know organizations from all over the world and and supplies into Thailand, and uh, uh, around this time a sort of understanding was reached between Thailand and and UNHCR and foreign governments that foreign foreign money would support these people and there would be a very deliberate and expedited effort to interview and you know f- fly away uh, those people who were going to resettle uh, uh, abroad mm-hmm. yeah no i can i can imagine um once once the U, the wife of the u.s president is there at, at, at on the grounds it must be mm-hmm. a, a really really big deal we have to get more money and, and funds in so that's right that's that's incredible. Thank you for that. I, I, I never even, you know, my father had left the camps um, already by June or July of 1979. So he was the first right. one into the camps, but then the first one out. Thank goodness. So he wasn't actually able to be around all of this. But many of our listeners still had parents in those yeah. camps at those times. So yeah. it's really wonderful to have this kind of. Uh, yeah, it's effort. this. This was. uh, uh this was the period of the mass exodus out of, of Cambodia. And for a while, these camps were like the second largest cities of Cambodians. They weren't in Cambodia, but Khao Dong had, I think, uh, 150,000 people at its, right. at its height. Uh, there, were, there were ad hoc camps along the border uh, which had probably tens of thousands, maybe a hundred thousand. I haven't talked about them because south of Aranya Patet, this Thai border town, was Khmer Rouge territory uh, on the Cambodian side, mm-hmm. and the people who came out there were under the control of the Cambodians. But they were kind of an exception because in most of Cambodia, as the Vietnamese army came in and as it approached individual towns and and communes and villages, the Khmer Rouge just kind of melted away and left everybody behind. Uh, and those people became free to do what they wanted. They they well they were left to fend for themselves and they they had to find food, they could go looking for family members and they could travel. And so north of Aranya Patet were these stretches of the border where people came on their own, came on their own volition. And they walked there, they came by bicycle, they came by ox cart, <clears throat> and they crossed <laughs> into what they thought was Thailand. Nobody, you know, nobody could quite say where did Cambodia end and where did Thailand begin. Mm-hmm. And just on their own, they set up these huge ad hoc settlements. 
uh, and just waited to see what would happen next. And at first they were entirely on their own. Uh, you know, some people brought gold that they had dug up from their backyards, you know, gold that they had buried in 1975. They brought it to the border and they used it for barter trade with <clears throat> Thais who would literally walk into these places with knapsacks full of basic supplies and charge them an arm and a leg. It was, it was outrageous. Uh, black market. Black market. Right. Uh, uh, but uh, the first time I saw that was a similar kind of situation where I described uh, with those Khmer Rouge soldiers. We were driving along a border road north of Aranya Patet, and I was with another journalist friend, a, a man named Michael Batty of the Reuters News Agency. And we decided, let's just stop here and walk to the border and see what we see. Uh, and so we just started walking along these you know, rice paddy dikes, and first there was no one, and then, oh, there's a person over there. Who's that? And then we kept walking, and then there was a gunshot in the distance, and then we kept walking, and oh, there's 20 people, and <laughs> we kept walking, and soon we were in the middle of an encampment of a thousand people, uh, all of whom were were just camped out under, you know, if they were lucky, they had some blue plastic sheeting, which they, with which they had put up a, a shelter with, you know, sticks cut from the, uh, from the trees and, you know, terrible conditions. I can't tell you how bad the sanitation was. Uh, a lot of people terribly sick, but here there was a form of personal freedom in that they weren't under the control of the Khmer Rouge. There were these, again, ad hoc uh, groups that were known as the Khmer Seri, the, the free Khmer, who were, uh, you know, each camp had its own and its own commander who might be feuding with the commander of, of the next camp. Uh, uh, but they did not insist on this social organization the way the, the, way the Khmer Rouge did. And so, uh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I just had a quick question. So these ad hoc camps didn't have the attention of the UN or the organization. They it, were it, just kind of grew naturally on their own. They grew naturally. Okay. They were organic, organic, we would say, these days. They yeah. they just sprang up. And uh, uh, early on, there was no NGO, you know, foreign aid support. But uh, that particular camp that I was talking about earlier was known for reasons we never discovered as 007. Uh, and as 007 became known back in, you know, in Bangkok and various places, NGOs started going to the place and they actually built a road uh, to run, I don't know, the half mile or whatever it was from an existing Thai road. They, you know, they just cut a road through the, <laughs> through the forest to reach this place. And then, you know, after a while, there were there were clinics, there were feeding programs, there were the handing out of basic supplies, uh, wells were being dug, you know, basic amenities were being were being provided. And there was still this steady flow of people arriving again on their own from the Cambodian hinterland. And sometime uh, late in 1979, the U.N., succeeded in convincing uh, the Thais to allow them to establish to open Kawi Dang, which was 20 miles away. And buses would come in on this new road and people who wanted to go would get on the bus and then go to Kawi Dang, where, where things were considerably more comfortable, more civilized and, and safer because these Khmer Seri groups every now and then would start shooting at each other. Uh, there was, there was all, always the fight to control territory and fight to control relief supplies. Uh, often, if you wanted to distribute re re relief supplies in a place like 007, you had to have an accommodation with that local commander. Mm -hmm. And the local commander, uh, you know, had all sorts of delusions of grandeur. And he would talk about how we're going to attack the Vietnamese and we're going to drive them out of Cambodia. And and this guy over here, he's the new minister of health. And this guy over here is the new minister of transportation. Uh, but if you wanted to 
distribute aid goods, you had to deal with this guy and maybe give him a cut of, of what you were going to, uh, uh, what you were going to hand out. Or, or there would be some fiction that uh, we're going to leave these supplies here and uh, uh, mind you, they must not go to soldiers. They're only for, they're only for civilians. Oh, don't worry, don't worry. They'll, they'll all go to mm-hmm. civilians, but you can imagine what would happen. <laughs> so the, generally the commanders of these organic camps that would kind of pop up <laughs> along the border, were they from what your understanding, were they Khmer Rouge soldiers? Or- no, they, they were not Khmer Rouge soldiers. A lot of them, a lot of them had been soldiers in the army of Lan No, the leader of the Cambodian government from 1970 to 75. Okay. Uh, so they were, they were people who, who, had, you know, were, were, were separate from the, the, uh, Khmer Rouge, but like the Khmer Rouge, they were very anti-Vietnamese and saw the Vietnamese as having invaded and occupied their their country. Uh, and you know, they they would wear fatigue uniforms and they had guns. You know, so some someone was supplying them uh, with with weapons, and uh, they had sort of an uneasy relationship with. You know, you go a mile or two up the border, and there might be a Khmer Rouge camp there. And so there was always this uneasy relationship between these Khmer Seri, free Khmers, and uh, and the and the Khmer Rouge. Uh, generally, it was thought that the Khmer Rouge were much more capable as actual soldiers <laughs> for actually confronting the Vietnamese than were these guys who. Uh, who often could seem more interested in in making money and lording it over refugees. Right, right. <laughs> no, I think that's a great point to bring up to talk about how did these camps really come up to be because we talk, there there were thousands from what I understand or hundreds at least of of these camps that were that were organic and not just the main <laughs> ones that had the attention of the UN and all the organizations mm-hmm. because everybody was flooding out of the country. I mean, <laughs> That's right. So they, they were somewhere. Yeah. They were somewhere. And uh, 007 was right at the side of a thousand year old Khmer temple. Uh, the ruins of a, of a Khmer temple dating from the great Khmer empire, which built Angkor Wat and all those amazing things uh, 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 near Siem Reap town in Cambodia. And I always wondered, and I, I, you know, I could never get an explanation as to whether the presence of that temple was what drew Cambodians to that particular place on the border. Mm. Uh, but uh, it, it, it did draw them. <laughs> yeah. There were, there was, you just could not believe your eyes when you went in and saw how many people were were camped out in this place. So, John, I wanted to also touch upon this point that you had mentioned um, prior before our recording was that you actually went back to the cities, Cambodian cities, for example, Phnom Penh and Battambang, I believe, mm-hmm. um, and, and was able to see what was left of these cities after during this time too, after the Cambodians have all been pushed out of, after the Khmer Rouge and they're, they're all along these borders of Thailand and going back to the actual cities, what did you witness when you sure. went back? Yeah. Well, all, all during this period that I'm talking about, it, it, was, it was basically not possible to get access to inside Cambodia. Mm. And so we would go to the border and, and, you know, interview refugees, what's going on in this town, what's going on in that town, what was your experience? Uh, The government that the Vietnamese had installed in Phnom Penh was under international boycott. Uh, Nobody except, nobody outside of the Soviet bloc countries, so Soviet Union, East Germany, Romania, places like that, Cuba, Nobody was recognizing that government in Phnom Penh. And that meant there, you know, no American embassy, no British embassy, no formal relations. But in April of 1980, I got an invitation from from this new government saying, 
you, you know, you have our permission to come in and be a reporter and write stories. And, and so I jumped at it, uh, as would, as would anyone. And the only way to get there is I actually flew in on a UN airplane that was delivering relief supplies because there was no, there was no, you know, commercial service between Thailand and Cambodia. So I had two weeks, a week in Cambo- in Phnom Penh, and then a week on the road driving around the Tonle Sap, the Great Lake of Cambodia. Uh, and, you know, talk about another mind-blowing experience. It, at the border, you got the feeling that the whole population of Cambodia had crossed into Thailand. But right. And you imagine Phnom Penh as being kind of a ghost town still, as it was during the Cam- uh, Khmer Rouge. But... but you know, Phnom Penh was a humming hive of activity uh, uh, with outdoor markets, with, you know, crowded streets, uh, uh, you know, thousands of people living there under very difficult conditions, you know, no running water, no public uh, uh, electricity, no banks, no, none of the things that we take for granted uh, uh, as the services that you would get in a in a city. So uh, I was there and I was, uh, you know, invited by the government and they assigned me a guy from the information ministry who would go around and be my interpreter. And he, you know, there were things that they wanted me to see and they wanted me to see the, the crimes of the Khmer Rouge, which were evidence was everywhere. And they wanted me to see, uh, you know, a newly restarted school, a new re- newly restarted factory, you know, to send the message out that we are fully in control and under us, Cambodia is recovering. But then in the afternoon, this guy would go home and I was basically free to just walk around <laughs> uh, and and talk to whomever I, I could talk to. And so I spent <laughs> a lot of time uh, just walking around the center of Phnom Penh and poking in here, poking in there. Uh, There were a few places I couldn't go, you know, Vietnamese military camps. Nope, you can't go in there. That's for sure. But people would approach me and, uh, and, and, and we would try to communicate. And I sort of got a feeling for, for what I, you know, what was the life of the city to the extent I could without being able to have deep in-depth conversations, witnessing with my own eyes. Mm -hmm. Uh, then we did a week, you know, they, they provided me with a car, a Soviet-built Lada <laughs> sedan. And with this interpreter and a driver, we got in the car and we, we drove uh, uh, first to Siem Reap, uh, the, the site of the Angkor temples, and, you know, drove through these, these scenes of just unbelievable devastation. Uh, it was almost like nothing had been rebuilt from the 1970 to 75 war. The, the highways were in terrible conditions, huge potholes or you know, in places the whole road is collapsed. Uh, uh, but again, a lot of activity, bicycle traders, you know, uh, these were guys who would ride their bicycles to the Thai border, load up with stuff and then ride their bicycles all the way back to Phnom Penh and sell these things in the market. So uh, we were almost never alone on this road. There was, there were always people in the villages along it or these bicycle traders. And so we spent a day at Angkor and, uh, uh, you know, got a tour of the temples with the the newly appointed conservator. And I may have mentioned to you that Angkor is one of my favorite subjects about Cambodia. And I, written a number of books about that, but it was just an amazing sight to see Angkor having, Angkor had been basically off limits for 10 years. And there was all this question about what what had happened to Angkor in those 10 years. And happily, the, the main answer was neglect. <laughs> uh, there wasn't any sort of war damage, you know, significant war damage to these places. Uh, and as I said, everywhere we came across, you know, signs of the crimes of the Khmer Rouge. And as a journalist, you're always trying to sort of get away from your government minder. Uh, 
And one day we were driving along and I said, let's just stop at this village right here and see what we see. And we stopped at the village and uh, got out and talking to people there. And very soon he says, well, I suppose you'll want to see the mass grave. <laughs> uh, uh, and so they, they led us a few hundred yards out of the, of the village and there was a mass grave of you know bones poking poking through uh through the soil uh and this was one of the main uh, you know messages that this government wanted to wanted to deliver that Cambodia was under the uh uh you know under control of 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 a gang of a gang of terrible criminals and mass murderers and the the new government liberated people from that and here we just stopped at one village selected randomly and found that it had its own mass grave just on the on the outskirts of it. So we were we were a night in Siem Reap, then a night in Badambang, and uh, uh, you know an, a, another question that I was trying to cover in this period was what was happening to the international food shipments that were going into Phnom Penh. Mm -hmm because there was a parallel effort. On the one hand, food was being shipped to the Thai-Cambodian border from the Thai side, and the parallel effort flew it and brought it by a ship into Cambodia itself. And the question is, what was happening to that rice, and that food? Was it being distributed? Was it being turned into a political weapon in which you reward people for loyalty to the new government? And I, I sort of found a mixed, uh, uh, you know, uh, a, a mixed response. We stopped at villages where people would say, no, nobody has brought us anything here. And then there were other places where they did seem to have received a shipment. So, so uh, from Badambang, we drove, we drove back to Phnom Penh and I <clears throat> flew back to Phnom, uh, Bangkok on another aid flight later on and then uh, there was basically no communication. So I didn't file a word uh, for two weeks when I was inside because literally there was no way, there was no way to. And so I wrote all my articles after getting out. And you know, in some, it was kind of an inspiring uh, experience in that people were all doing what it took to get on with their lives uh, and, you know, in, in places there were, you know, people were in really, really high spirits. They weren't, they weren't depressed. They weren't, uh, they, they were happy to be on their own and making their ways as best they could. Uh, so, uh, you know, the bicycle traders in particular were very impressive people to me because, you know, they were riding these rickety old rusty things. Uh, and riding them like 250 miles, 200 miles to get from Phnom Penh to the border and then riding them back. And, you know, there's there's a limit to how much you could carry on the back of a bicycle. Right. But uh, but they managed. So <laughs> what a what a wonderful representation of just of a rebirth and of yeah. continuing to move forward, regardless of what had happened in the in the past. And it we will start from scratch we'll start from a bicycle we'll <laughs> put as much as we can on here and we'll continue yeah so john what what was the overall biggest lesson that you'd learned from this entire experience would you say mm. well i would say up until then i had never known that we have to that we shouldn't take for granted the peace and prosperity and order that we have in this country and so many, so many countries of the world. And, and that it is every now in the history of humankind, there are these terrible, tragic interludes where all of these things go out the window and people are, are, are forced onto survival mode. I, I hadn't, you know, I hadn't, I'd read about that, but I, I hadn't really appreciated it until I saw it with my own eyes. And I hadn't appreciated, you know, how much I and my family and, and most of the people in this country 
have as a as a result of that. I would say that was that was the big takeaway for me. But you know, I I it, it, you know I I would be. Uh, I don't want to oversell my humanitarian credentials here in that I also viewed this, this whole episode as a fascinating time of journalism, to be there, to be witnessing it and to be writing it down and to sort of making a record of it for, for whomever comes next. <laughs> well, I think I speak for all my listeners when I say thank you. Thank you so much, John. Oh, you're, you're very welcome. During this time. You know, we need we needed those journalists to come and, and, and <clears throat> really get into the core of what the heck was happening. Mm. Um, because if it wasn't for the fact of people there taking these stories and going down that dark path to really understand <laughs> and learn what was going on um, and, and sharing that with the world, then, then people don't know. People just mm-hmm. don't know what is going on. And, and, and your efforts are definitely... Um, definitely needed so okay well thank you i appreciate you thank you so much for this um this time and and chatting and sitting with me and i'm sure our listeners can get so much value out of hearing what you have to say um if for people who you had mentioned you had written several books uh about Mm -hmm. or what but and also the, the the articles um i will be posting for everybody a list of the articles that john had had written during this time period so you can check it out but for people who want to learn more about you, John, is there a hub or some place that people can find you? Yes. Well, uh, my website is www.john-burgess.net. And it's, it's J-O-H-N dot B-U-R-G-E-S-S dot net. And uh, you'll, you'll see links to my uh uh, my books there, and you can also go on Amazon. And if you just search for John Burgess Cambodia, uh, my author's page will come up. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Well, again, thank you so much for the time and sitting down with us. Um, for anyone who wants to check him out, please do. And uh, yes, thank you so much again for your time. Okay, you're very welcome.